Visit AFA.net. Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to American Family Radio's Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome to a brand new broadcast edition of Focal Point on American Family Radio. I am your host, Brian Fisher, congenial, convivial, amiable, and effervescent. As always. Rob Gardner weighing in. We're giving Jeff Reed a much-deserved day off. Glad to have you in the conversation. A couple of quick things before we jump into uh, content today. want to remind you about a new documentary that American Family Studios, that's a division of AFA that they have produced. It's called In His Image. This is, this is a critically important documentary because it addresses questions in our culture about gender and sexuality from a biblical perspective. You know, every church in America, and we've got friends and family members, and we're asking ourselves these kind of questions. Can you be homosexual and be a Christian? Is that possible? What if somebody genuinely feels like they are trapped in the wrong body? What about that? Did God make me this way? Is this God's fault that I struggle with this issue? And is change even possible? Now, you can register by going to inhisimage.movie. Inhisimage.movie. You can register for a sneak preview. And you can also stay updated about the premiere of the movie on October the 20th. Be sure that you do that. All right, well, let's uh, turn our attention to the Word of God. Got to take care of one piece of housekeeping here before we do that, and then we will jump right into the Word. We are in the book of Numbers right now, as you're aware, working our way through the Scriptures. We have, we're using a schedule that you can find at pray.afa.net. It's a three-year schedule, that will take you all the way through the Word of God in three years. And it has a prayer that incorporates the very words of the passage of Scripture each day so you can pray God's Word right back to Him. We are now in Numbers 33 through 35 today. Now, the way this chapter begins is we find out that Moses recorded their journey through the wilderness in detail every single stage. And we see the number of times that God lifted his cloud from over the tabernacle, directing them to pack up and to move on until the clouds settled down. They did that 42 different times. But we're told that every time they went out, they went out by the command of the Lord. By the command of the Lord, and Moses wrote down the places that they moved, the places that they camped at the Lord's command. 42, dif 42 different times they changed location. So if we uh, fix our eyes on Christ and follow him, we get to a point where we'll be able to look back, maybe toward the end of your life, you'll be able to look back, and you'll be able to see God's direction, God's hand at every major turning point, every major move in your lives. So you stay put until the cloud lifts and sets out. When it does, then you pack up and follow the cloud. Uh, Debbie's mom lived with us for the last 20 years of her life. That was her 33rd move. So she'd moved 32 times in her life, every one of those orchestrated by God. And you can see God's hand in each one of those moved. So uh, each one of those moves. Now we're told in verses 5 through 38 that they camped everywhere they went. 42 times they camped. Now if you think about camping, a lot of us have done it with families. You've probably done it with your family. Camping is something that is temporary. If you're camping, there's one thing that you know you're not home. 
You're not at home. Home is somewhere else. Home is the place that you look forward to going to when your camping trip is over. Remember how good it felt to come back home, be able to relax in your own house? Well, that's what you do after the camping trip is over. So when you're done camping, you pack up your tent and you head to your home, your permanent home, which is what we are going to do someday, ladies and gentlemen. Paul says this earthly body, says this in 1 Corinthians 5, is like a tent, or 2 Corinthians 5, is like a tent, which is designed for temporary lodging. This body is like an earthly tent. One day we are going to pack it up, we're going to stow it away, and we're going to trade it in for an eternal home that is indestructible. Remember that song that says, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. So never forget, ladies and gentlemen, that our sights are always to be set on the age to come. You know, there's an expression out there that life is hard and then you die. Well, yeah, that's true. But here's the good news is that you die. If you are centered in Christ, then dying is a good thing. It's the day we look forward to because we'll be free of all of the impulses in our own sinful bodies. We'll live in a world that for the first time is run right. You know, I've been talking to people that, I mean, they have a, they have a sense of dread about what's going to happen on November 3 because they realize what's at stake because if the wrong people get in power, this nation will not be run right. And that's a worry to all of us. Well, one day uh, we are told we are going to have the opportunity to live in a world that is run right. And that's what the Bible is really uh, all about. So we have a promised land ahead of us, just like the people of Israel did. The promised land for us is the age to come. It's what we're looking for. It's what we are preparing for. And Canaan is just a picture or a symbol or a metaphor for that permanent home that awaits us in the unseen world. I remember hearing a story once told by a returned missionary. They came to the United States on the same plane that the Beatles were on. And there were massive crowds there to meet the Beatles at the airport, yelling and screaming and waving signs and all that kind of thing. And this missionary and his wife got back. They got off the plane and there was absolutely nobody nobody there to greet them. So they can look over here and see this massive crowd around the Beatles. Nobody there even to welcome them back to America. You know, and he complained about that to his wife. He said, look, you know, this, this is just not right. They get all this attention. We've been overseas giving our lives to the kingdom, and there's nobody, there's, there's nobody here to greet us when we came home. And his wife put her her arm on his hand and said, honey, we're not home yet. So the best is yet to come. Now Moses also tells us in chapter 33, down in verse 4, that when, the, when they God delivered them triumphantly as the word in the sight of all the Egyptians, vindicated in the sight of all the Egyptians, verse 4 says, on their gods also the Lord executed judgments. On their gods, the Lord executed judgments. Now, this is something that not a lot of people know, but this whole thing of them being delivered from bondage was a matter of spiritual warfare because the Bible tells us that every one of the plagues was a direct confrontation between God, the true God, and the demon gods that were worshipped by the Egyptians. They worshipped the Nile, for instance. Well, God poisoned the Nile, defeated their god in spiritual combat. They worshipped gods that were in the shape of bulls. That's where Aaron got the idea. And God caused a disease that broke out, decimated their entire cattle population, so he defeated that god in direct combat. They worshipped the sun. God blotted out the sun for three days. So God confronted the demon gods of Egypt and destroyed them head to head. God won every showdown. That's a reminder to us, even as we go toward this election day, that national affairs and international affairs are ultimately matters of spiritual 
warfare. That's why it's so important that we pray, as we do here on this program, every day for our nation, for our leaders, for our president, and for our nation. Because the spiritual warfare right now that's targeted against our president is as intense as I believe anything that we've experienced in the United States since the days of Abraham Lincoln. I would suggest that the spiritual warfare that's directed, the demonic warfare that's directed against our president is more intense than any president has received since the days of Abraham Lincoln. And you look at the hate that is directed, the raw, unadulterated hate that's being directed at the president. This is demonic in origin, demonic in nature. Then Moses gives them one more command down in verse 52 of chapter 33, uh, or a record of what they did, says, You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images and demolish all their high places. So it's absolutely crucial for the success because because Moses said, look, when you go into this land, you occupy it, you live there, it's absolutely crucial, it's non-negotiable, it's absolutely essential that if you want your new nation to have success and prosperity and security, it is dependent on centering your spiritual life in the true and living God. You don't do that. It doesn't matter what kind of natural resources you have at your disposal. So what you got to do is you have to destroy all counterfeit expressions of spirituality. They need to be exposed. They need to be debunked. They need to be demolished. That's why we expose the reality that in the Black Lives Matter movement, they invoke the spirits of their ancestors. They're doing what they do by the power of so-called departed spirits. They're not departed spirits. They are demonic spirits. They're invoking them by mentioning their name, bringing them in to play in the world that we can see. So I just want to say this. The most patriotic thing that you and I can do, the single most patriotic thing that you and I can do is to give our energies to pursuing a relationship with God and to purifying the spiritual life of the American people. Now, in chapter 34, we see that the word border occurs 14 times. 14 times. Verse 12, this shall be be your land as defined by its borders all around. So we learn a couple of things from this. Borders are important. Borders are good. Borders are great. Borders are are necessary, and borders are God's idea. He's the one that sets them. They ultimately reflect his sovereign control over all of history and over all nations. Good fences make good neighbors, whether these neighbors are people or nations. Then there's a straight-up affirmation for the death penalty for those that commit murder. They had cities of refuge. If, If a man died accidentally... You didn't know whether it was accidental or on purpose, but if a man died at the hands of another, then the one who was responsible would go to a city of refuge, and he would be safe there until he came to trial. Then if he was exonerated, he could live in the city of refuge until the high priest died, then he could go back home. If he was guilty, the murderer was put to death. That's how Israel could go through the entire wilderness experience and never build a single prison. Let's uh, go to prayer. Take these things to the Lord in prayer if you join me. Sovereign Lord, I pray today in the name of Jesus. We all pray together. I pray for I pray for my family. I pray for this listening audience, every man, woman, and child right now within the sound of my voice. We pray together for this nation, every man, woman, and child in this land. We pray for every elected official, especially this day, our president, President Trump. And I pray that we will be so dependent upon you and so attentive to your voice that we may be able to look back on our life's journey and see that you have directed us at every stage. I pray that we will only set out at your command. I pray that you will give us the strength to drive out all the works of sin and the flesh and the world in our lives and in our nation. May no works of Satan be left to be barbs in our eyes and thorns 
in our sides. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed. Treat them with respect and give them equal treatment under the law. This is Richard Land. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name and you are listening to Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Oh, I, I had this uh, soundbite in the roster yesterday. I didn't have time to get to it, so I want to lead off with it today. This is clip number 10, uh, Rob. And, uh, dads, this ought to be an encouragement to you, the difference that you can make in the life of your son. If you want some help with that, I've written a little book called The Boy to Man Book. Get it at afastore.net. Uh, not great piece of literature, but it does take the wisdom of Solomon, puts it in digestible form so you can read it with your son and help him on his journey to manhood. Now, here is a player. I didn't even write down the name of the, the, this guy as a player, but he's an outstanding NFL player. Just signed a $94 million contract. Rob, do you remember who I'm talking about here? I cannot. Uh, I it plays for the I'm Steelers, sorry. I think. Anyway, that's beside the point. The point here is I want you to listen to what he says at his press conference when he's talking about this Mondo contract that he signed. He starts talking about the people that made a huge difference in his life, and he eventually gets to his father. Listen to this. My dad, um, <clears throat> my dad, he's he's kind of been able to be. Um, my dad's even though at a young age, he's really. Dang. And my dad's kept me in line, um, you know. 
he's really, you know, he's he's been my since I was young. Since I was young, I told my dad I wanted to play in the NFL, and he never he never really let me slip. You know, getting in trouble here and there as a youngin. My dad never just kept his foot off me. Decisions, things I wanted to do. You know, he was able to to tell me no, and didn't really show explanation. But as I grew older, I was able to understand so much as to why he did those things. And you know, my dad has been so much more than a father. He, he coached me as a kid. He's really, you know, been, you know, he's actually been my everything for me along with my mom. And so I really thank him a lot um, for what he's done. And um, I know he'll continue to be a great father to me. And, um, you know, hopefully one day I, I get a family. I can, I, I can treat my sons and my daughters the way my dad has treated me and my brothers and sisters. That's a great testimony to the presence of a father in a young man's life. And notice he said what he thanked his father for. At this stage, he's looking back now, and he's thanking his father for keeping him in line and for telling him no. And, Dad's one of the things we've got to understand, we've got to learn, is that sometimes being a good dad means to say no. And it's not pleasant when it happens. Your son may say nasty things to you or even about you, but what we learn from this and what the Bible affirms is in time, your son will come to thank you for what you did, really, to protect him from himself. Now, let's go um, back to what's happened with the president and his dealing with COVID and reintegrating into life in the White House. And, you know, he's, he's hearty. He's healthy. He looks and sounds absolutely normal. He's just cooking on all cylinders, this is three days after going into the hospital. And after the left could not stop talking the fa about the fact that he's on death, he's on his deathbed. He's, he's on, on the door of death. The Grim Reaper is coming for the President of the United States. And none of that was true. In fact, he was ready to go home the day after he went in. That's how mild the case was. And I suggested yesterday, and I still believe that today, that the, the, the regimen of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and zinc that he took back sometime this spring, remember he took it prophylactically. Prophylactically means you're taking it to prevent the worst from happening. And I believe it worked. I think part of the reason, I'm not saying it's the whole thing, but I think it definitely is a part of the issue here, that he took this regimen that had been determined in clinical trials to be effective at slowing down or stopping the coronavirus. He took it, and sure enough, it did. He had a very mild case, uh, bounced back, was back to his old self almost right away. And then he got, gets back to the White House. You've probably seen the pictures. Goes up on the balcony outside the White House, takes off his mask, and stands there a free man, mask-free. And this just set the talking snake media off. They, they went into conniption fits over this. Let's listen to Wolf Blitzer, clip number one. Well, clearly the photo up there, you saw the president walk up. Uh, he's standing there, and he did, he did take off his mask, put it in, the po in his pocket. Uh, I don't know what kind of statement he's trying to make by showing off that he could take off his mask. Uh, give, uh, gives a thumbs up over there, but it's uh, clearly... All about the photo op the president wants to show. He's back in action, uh, and that's why he took off his mask, trying to give uh, some sort of symbolic gesture there. Uh, and it's uh, not necessarily the right gesture to give at this point. Well, maybe, Wolf, maybe the point that he was trying to make is, look, I'm the president of the United States. If I can beat this thing, you can beat this thing. Uh, so it may be a, a way to provide encouragement to the American people. And that's what he said. Look, don't let this thing beat you. Don't let this thing get you down. This thing can be faced, it can be confronted, and it can be beaten. Another thing the media was out there doing is saying that when Trump got back from Walter Reed, the White House staff, for the first time, got some guidance about how to deal with coronavirus. That is a big, fat lie. The White House staff has been receiving emails about the coronavirus and how to respond to it since April. That's when the first one went out. Do not, ladies and gentlemen, let the talking snake media lie to you. All right, here's Chris Cuomo, Chris the Body Cuomo, clip number two 
a rare moment of honesty from Chris Cuomo. Listen to what he admits at the end of this. Listen all the way through to this to the end because that's where the payoff comes. Clip two. There he is. Hair blown majestically, <laughs> reshooting the scene for his own ad. I hold rallies and I tell you to ignore masks and I rip mine off as I vanquish the virus because I am a leader. Fear not, COVID. What a bunch of <laughs> Going back to the White House, if you want to know the reality, the truth, okay? The virus is the truth. You've got a president who was a drunk driver who is pushing others to drive drunk. That's what he is. Do I want to see a drunk driver get hurt? No. But I worry more about the people he hits. And I love seeing him do that victory lap in that limo. Thank God. You know why? I knew that meant he has to be okay. Not the people who were in there with him, PPE up to their nose. Now they got a quarantine. He doesn't give a And now... I don't have to feign any extra measure of compassion. That's the payoff line right there. Chris Cuomo says, all these things I've been saying about not wishing ill on the president and hoping he gets better, that was all fake. I was faking that. I was pretending to be compassionate, but I didn't mean a single solitary thing I said or did. And I'm so glad now that I don't have to fake compassion anymore for this president. You know, it's interesting. Also, he said in that soundbite that when he saw him in the limo, he says, I knew that meant he had to be okay. In other words, Chris Cuomo is acknowledging that Donald Trump beat this thing back. How he did it, we don't know. Uh, I think the hydroxychloroquine had as much to do with it as anything, but he saw right away that convinced him that he was okay and there was much weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, I remember Chris Cuomo was just all over Donald Trump for not leaving this mask on. This is a guy, remember, when he was diagnosed with COVID-19, he broke quarantine. He didn't wear a mask. He put other people in danger by going to his beach house, unmasked, riding a bike, got into a fight with a bicyclist who called him out, and then he pretended that nothing ever happened, and he threw a party when his quarantine was over. Apparently does not want the president to have the same uh, luxury. Let's go to John Berman. This is clip number three, his CNN. And he's again commenting on President Trump being out on the balcony, hale, hearty, healthy, and mask-free. Clip three. President in that Sunset Boulevard gesture whipped his mask off in front of the American people on the nightly news last night. So, as a doctor whose job it is, you know, take it off. Please, don't even put it on the screen. Please take it off. Because that's going to kill people. <laughs> he says, get that image off of my screen. I do not want me or my people to have to look at a president who has recovered from a bout of COVID. I don't want anybody to see that. He says, because it's going to kill people. Well, I'll tell you one thing, John Berman. There is a lot of bad stuff that you can get from watching CNN, but catching COVID-19 is not one of them. Now, let's go to clip number four. Here's Mika Brzezinski and her husband, Joe Scarborough. And Mika's getting herself worked up into a froth here over the fact that she thinks Donald Trump ought to be prosecuted for manslaughter, for driving around in a limo without wearing a mask, for walking out on the balcony at the White House without wearing a mask. Can't he be prosecuted for this? Clip number four. Is he legally immune? What if his Secret Service men and women who have to drive him around in these vans and get exposed to his deadly coronavirus, mm -hmm. which, what if one of them gets sick and die? What? what if somebody at that Rose Garden event gets sick and dies? I don't want this to happen, yeah. and I wish for his health. But I'm just wondering, he's pushing all of this against the advice of the prof professionals in his government, right. against the advice of scientists. Right. At some, some point, isn't this... Manslaughter? Isn't this manslaughter? we got to prosecute this man for killing uh, other people. Now, a couple of things along the line of this COVID thing. This is stuff I've just came across this morning and doing research 
for the program. And she's talking about the fact he's exposing people to danger by not wearing a mask. This is the top Italian epidemiologist. In other words, Italy has its own Dr. Anthony Fauci. His name is Dr. Matteo Bassetti. He is the director of the Infectious Diseases Department at the San Martino Hospital in Genoa. So he is their top-of-the-line uh, infectious disease guy, their top-of-the-line epidemiologist. And he said that this mask mandate wearing, the mandating of the wearing of masks outdoors is a mistake. And it has, quote, no basis in science. You know, I hate to repeat myself, but I have to. Because you've got people all across the Fruited Plain that are wearing masks. They think they're going to die if they don't. I mean, I have never seen people. You know, and up here in the Pacific Northwest, I'll tell you one thing I've learned about liberals. These people are more compliant to tyrants than anybody you've ever seen. Liberals don't fight back against tyrannical edicts. They just go along with it. They wear the mask and they get on you if you are not complying with the edict of the tyrant governor. But here's what Dr. Persetti said on Facebook. I have tried to look for scientific evidence on the use of outdoor masks and their potential benefits for virus transmission. I could find none. So that's the Anthony Fauci of Italy. And remember, this guy doesn't have an axe to grind. He's not looking to give his buddies in Big Pharma a billion-dollar payday. He just wants patients to get better. And he says, I've researched the scientific literature. I've studied the tests that have been done. Uh, I have studied the studies that have been done. There's not a scintilla of evidence that masks can protect you from respiratory diseases. Not one. Don't just take my word for it. Take my, the word of the leading epidemiologist in the country of Italy. And I've explained why scientifically it's impossible. It's impossible for these masks to work, to protect you from coronavirus. Maybe they can protect you from certain bacteria that are floating in the air, but they cannot possibly protect you from coronavirus. Why? Because the pores in the masks, the openings in the masks that allow things to filter through, those openings are 30 times bigger, 30 times bigger, ladies and gentlemen, than the virion that causes COVID-19. So in other words, it's, it's useless to think that a mask is protecting you because the virions that infect you, they are flooding right through the mask that you are uh, wearing. So anyway, so that's, that's the guy in Italy saying, look, nothing to this mask business. I encourage you to believe what he has to say because he's telling you the truth. Now, Kaylee McEnany, clip five, she's the president's spokesman. She's been diagnosed with COVID. And there she is bouncing around, talking in front of a camera. In fact, we find out she may be infected according to the test. But remember, these tests now that they're using are so highly sensitive that they can detect dead pieces of virus. So your body carries around dead pieces of the virus, no longer active. You can't infect anybody because all the virus fragments in you, uh, they're dead. But this test is so sensitive, and they designed it that way. Remember, their agenda is to, make, to, to convince people that this virus is an unstoppable foe. So their interest is in maximizing the number of people that are diagnosed. You know, the real number is the number of deaths. That's the number that counts. And all they want to talk about is the number of infections. But Kaylee McEnany, this soundbite, tells you there's a lot more to it than just the number of infections. Clip four. Uh, clip yeah, I'm five. feeling great. I'm having no symptoms. You know, I'm very blessed to um, have a mild case or really just an asymptomatic case. So she's got a very mild case. She's got an asymptomatic case. In other words, she's showing no symptom, symptoms whatsoever. But this test has revealed that she's got coronavirus. Well, what the, what the test is detecting is dead pieces of the virus that are floating around inside her body. So remember, the number to look at is the number of deaths. That's the number to look at. That's the number that actually means something. How many people are dying 
from coronavirus. That's the number that counts. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're listening to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Be right back. A prayer. Lord God, thank you. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio, the home of the fastest 60 minutes in American media, heading for the home stretch. Meep, meep. Want to remind you that we have a special virtual town hall Thursday night. You can go to AFA at home, AFA at home, and get more information about this thing. It's going to be something to help prepare you how to think about this election that we're facing. It's going to, it's going to address things like religious liberty, censorship in social media, the sanctity of life, the judicial branch, the SCOTUS nomination, Elizabeth Coney Barrett, socialism, and the threat that we are facing to the American uh, Republic. Now, um, some more foolishness out there in the COVID front. Here's a story from England. Listen, I want you to imagine this. This is how callous people have become. You know, it'd be one thing if any of this stuff worked. It'd be one thing if any of this stuff worked. Remember, it's not casual contact. Even the CDC says you got to be, even Deborah Burke says, you got to be within six feet of an infected person for 15 minutes. Before you have something to worry about, you got to be within six feet of somebody for 15 minutes. So it's not something that passes through casual uh, contact. Now, here's a woman. She, her, she just lost her husband. She's at a funeral service 
and you can see that they're socially distancing everybody in the funeral service. All the chairs are way far apart. She's sitting in the middle of the floor, close to the front, all by herself. She's completely sitting all by herself. Nobody to her left, nobody to her right, grieving her husband, whose body is in the coffin in front of her. Well, her son looks at that and says, I'm not going to let that happen. He moves his chair right next to his mother, and he puts an arm around her, begins to comfort her, and then to the left, the man sitting to her left does the same thing. And then you can see it on the security camera in the funeral home. Just a couple of seconds later, the funeral director comes barging into the middle of the funeral, waving his hands. He interrupts the service, and he says, you have to put your chairs back. You can't move the chairs. You were told you can't move the chairs. Well, you know, if it was me, if it was my mother, I wouldn't have moved my chair. But they did. They obediently uh, moved their chairs. So it's just crazy. You know, and the son said, look, look, I can, this is uh, in England, I can sit in a restaurant. I can sit in a pub. I can live at her house. I can travel at a limousine to the crematorium with six people in it. But I can't give my mom a cuddle at my dad's funeral. In fact, he has to interrupt the service and tell everybody, move your chairs back to where you found them. Now, there's a, something else that is at, at risk here. You know, the CDs, CDC has already uh, bashed Thanksgiving. Can't do Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's out. No Thanksgiving. So they're killing our fun at Thanksgiving. Now, what about Thanksgiving? Okay, well, I'm going to refer to Dr. Anthony Fauci as the Grinch who stole Thanksgiving. Feast your ears on clip six. Then there's areas of the country that very well might be hot. They may be red zones where there's enough infection around that you really better be careful when you congregate people, particularly indoors. So I say that some people in this country are going to be able to have a relatively normal type of a Thanksgiving. But in other areas of the country, it's going to be you better may hold off and maybe just have immediate family. Make sure you do it in a way that people wear masks where they have and you don't have large crowds of people. And so he says, that's what I would do. So uh, now you have lost your Thanksgiving. You can't exercise the gift of hospitality. You can not invite people in your church that you love. You can not invite people in your small group that you love. It's got to be just you and immediate family only. No guests, no hospitality, no love being expressed, given, or received. The Grinch who stole Thanksgiving. Now, clip number eight. This is Joe Biden. You know, and this guy just can't help stepping in it. He doesn't even think about the words that are coming out of his mouth. So he says, look, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been stuck in my hall closet since this thing began. I've been hunkered down. I've been in the basement. I've had a bag over my head. And I haven't been able to come out hardly at all. You know, in 10 days in September, he didn't have any public appearances whatsoever. None. So 10 days, almost a third of the month, he was nowhere to be found. And so Joe Biden tells us here who he has to thank for the fact that he was able to hide in his hall closet for the month of September. Number one, we don't know exactly what she will do, although the expectation is that she may very uh, well that's the wrong move clip, over, Rob, let's over. Back up. We need to get clip eight. This is Joe Biden, clip eight. This is Joe Biden explaining why he could hunker down in the coat closet. Sequestered in my home is because some black woman was able to stack the grocery shelf. So Joe Biden says, you know, I, because I'm an important person, I got to lock myself in my hall closet at home. It was some black woman that had to go out there and risk her life stocking shelves so I could eat. That's why I was able to stay home. She risked her life so I wouldn't have to. Now, here's uh, clip nine. Here is Rudy Giuliani and... He is talking about the fact that Biden give, gives these speeches with his mask on, even when there's nobody around. Clip number nine. 
You don't have to slavishly wear a mask. I mean, look, Joe Biden gives a speech with a mask on. The only thing in danger is the teleprompter. Yeah. I mean, everybody else is, you know, 100 feet away. The teleprompter, the only, the only thing that will get, right, will get right. uh, COVID is a is teleprompter that he uses. So, yeah, that Joe Biden, he's got to protect everybody, even, protect, even, even trying to protect his teleprompter by not wearing a mask to protect everybody. Now, we've talked about earlier in the program about the fact that there is a, a level of rabid hatred for president that I don't believe we've seen since 1860. And I want to give you an example of it. This is clip number 11, Rob. You know, Chris Wallace wants to present himself as the voice of moderation, the voice of reason, the voice of objectivity, but he's not. He has become a rabid partisan, and he goes after Steve Cortez, who's a member of Donald Trump's campaign team, goes after him in this clip like a rabid dog. Listen carefully for the intensity and the aggressiveness in Chris Wallace. He's supposed to be an interviewer. He's turned into an interrogator. Let's listen. Clip 11. Steve, it doesn't matter. Everybody no. that was in that room was tested. Steve, everybody that was in that room was tested. And the Cleveland right. Clinic's regulation was it didn't matter. Everybody except and for the three of us on the stage was to wear a mask. And people from the Cleveland Clinic came over and offered the first family mask, thinking maybe they didn't have them. They were waved away. And the Commission on Presidential Debates has issued a statement saying, from now on, if you don't wear a mask, you're going to be escorted from the hall. So forget this question of being tested Chris, beforehand. Everybody was tested beforehand. But no, I'm going to finish my question. Everybody was told to wear a mask. Why did the first family and the chief of staff feel that the rules for everybody else didn't apply to them? No, Steve, Hall. they weren't and distanced, and there were rules, and there was no, there was they, no freedom of choice. I, they broke the Chris, rules. I was there, I they, was there like no, you were, and they Steve, were distanced. Wh why those did they break the rules? Those chairs were not close together. Look, those chairs were not close together. And again, we also believe that people It doesn't matter, Steve. The rules from the Cleveland Clinic they were close together, Steve. And the rules okay. from the Cleveland Clinic were everybody wears you know, a mask. Why didn't they? Chris, Chris, the way you're starting to harangue me now actually reminds me of what you did to the president during that debate on Tuesday night when oh, he had yeah. to debate I, he, not I just Joe him. No, and then he had to he had to debate not just Joe, Joe Biden but you as well. You were not a neutral moderator then. I don't mind tough questions. I welcome you know how reasonably tough questions, but what I don't think is okay is for you to become the effective opposition to the president. Okay? And those everyone there was tested in the crowd. They were distanced from each other. People can make reasonable Steve, decisions that, for themselves. All right, Steve Cortez here. You know, and you can hear Chris Wallace. You, you, you ought to see his facial expression. He completely lost his cool. He was volcanically angry. And what this means is, is that Donald Trump got to him. Donald Trump rankled him. Donald Trump ruffled the unruffable Chris Wallace. Trump got under his skin and Trump flushed him out. As a member of the Talking Snake Media, we now know exactly who Chris Wallace is. He is a partisan hack. That's been revealed and proved for all to see. You know, and here's a question that Chris Wallace didn't think to ask, or nobody thought to ask him. You know, it's all about the rules. You broke the rules like he's their nanny. You broke the rules. You can't do that. That's against the rules. So the idea of the Cleveland Clinic is saying, look, wearing a mask in a situation like this is absolutely unshakably critical to human health. Why didn't they require Chris Wallace to wear a mask? How come he got an exemption if you got to wear a mask or you're going to endanger the health of the next president of the United States? That question was not raised and therefore was not answered. You know, occasionally, uh, here's Ted Koppel, clip 12. This is another member of the Talking Snake media who got who had a moment of awakening here, clip number 12, when he is told that conservatives are ditching the talking snake media in the roves, clip 12. And you're telling me that, that they have more people coming to them <laughs> than collectively come to ABC News, NBC News, CBS News, New York Times, Washington Post, Spell that out for me. Where are they going? So there's a right-wing commentator named Ben Shapiro. So, again, the media's take here is that if Trump had just said the right things, 
If Trump had been super strict in what he said, then he wouldn't have gotten COVID. He's very popular among conservatives. And in the last 30 days on his Facebook page, he has gotten 51.4 million interactions. That's more than five times as many as the New York Times. And it's more than CBS, CNN, um, NBC, ABC combined. Uh, here. You're kind of leaving me speechless here. <laughs> First time Ted Koppel has ever been speechless in his life because he cannot believe that nattering nabobs like you and me would ditch him and his buddies in the Talking Snake media for conservative media. He can't understand it. He cannot wrap his head around it. Yeah, that's, why that, that's why that famous liberal back in 1972 could not believe that Richard Nixon carried 49 states because she says, I don't know anybody who voted for Richard Nixon. Well, I wonder why that is. Now, by the way, looks like the confirmation hearing for Amy Coney Barrett is going to be going to be held. Ron Johnson from Wisconsin said, if I got to go in there in a moon suit, I'm going in there to vote. Now, here's what Joe Biden pledges to do about Roe v. Wade. This is clip number seven. Let's listen. Number one, we don't know exactly what she will do, although the expectation is that she may very well move to overview, overview overrule Roe. And but the only thing, the only responsible response to that would be to pass legislation making Roe the law of the land. That's what I would do. OK, so that's what Joe Biden has pledged to do. You know, and, and you know, I have I have conservative friends that are pro-life. I think they're genuinely pro-life. They genuinely believe it's a baby and that abortion is the killing of a baby in the womb. But they're going to vote for Biden. I don't understand that. You know, if you believe it's a baby in the womb, how could you support a guy who's running for office who is determined to pass a law that allows those babies to be killed up until the moment that they are born? So you got a lot of people out there, self-proclaimed conservatives, are supporting Biden. I just don't know how they process this in their own heads. You know, and one of the, you know, and, and this is a pipe dream. This is a pipe dream that he could get a law banning uh, abortion. I mean, uh, protecting abortion through all now that he could get a law like that through Congress. If they could have, they would have. You will never be able to get that kind of ban through Congress. And that's why they're so spooked by Barrett, because the Supreme Court has always been their super legislature. The Supreme Court has always been their fail-safe mechanism. If they cannot get what they want from the Constitution, through the Constitution, through the Congress, which is the only branch of government that is authorized by the Constitution to enact legislation, the Supreme Court doesn't have any authority to enact legislation, but they keep going back to the Supreme Court. They're terrified of Amy Coney Barrett, and that will take away their stranglehold on the Supreme Court on this legislature, because if they something they want and they can't get it through the legislative process that's identified and authorized in the Constitu Constitution, they will go around Congress and get what they want from the Supreme Court, which has absolutely zero authority to pass any sort of legislation. One other story I want to make you aware of, you know, in, in Rome in 64 AD, there was a fire that consumed 10 out of the 14 quarters or precincts in Rome, burned the city to the ground. The houses were close together, fire started, burned the city to the ground. And Nero had to find somebody to blame because people were upset at what happened to their city. And he blamed it on the Christians. He said the Christians started this fire people believed them and that was the most in beginning of the most intense period of persecution well a woke oregon professor said christians white christians are responsible for the wildfires on the west coast it for today see you back here tomorrow the views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the american family association or american